The Knocking Man by Frank Tuttle Night strolled down Shadow Street. Street lamps buzzed and flickered to life as she passed. Elsewhere, sirens rose and fell as the night people crept out on their dark errands. Elsewhere, a pair of gunshots rang out, crack, crack, and elsewhere, a woman's voice rose up in a long and wordless scream. Night paused at the corner of shadow and light, paused and lingered, wrapped in dancing shadows and expectant silence. Not complete silence, for the city never truly held still. Papers fluttered. Bits of trash rustled past in the gutter. A tomcat yowled, and another answered. Night lingered, waiting. Footsteps, running, dancing, kicking at newspaper boxes at each other. Glass shattered. Youthful voices sounded, loud and then louder still. Night held her breath. Three young men charged out of the alley between Roy's shoe repair and the boarded, burned husk of a bakery. The young men turned toward Light Street, still hooting in cautious laughter, and ran on, a tangle of white sneakers and short pants and two large shirts, until they'd reached the looming pitched roof of Mortimer and Son's funeral parlor. The young men slowed, stopped, cast wary glances up and down Shadow Street. You said you wasn't scared, said one. I ain't, said another. Then do it, chorused two. The smallest of the young men shuffled from foot to foot. I heard something down the street. You don't hear nothing. Do it, or we find somebody else to run with. The small youth raised his hands. I'm going, I'm going. He walked to the weathered steps that led from the sidewalk to the door. He hesitated a moment and then darted up the seven steps and struck the tall black door three times with his fist. His companions hooted in laughter. You dead now, cried one. You know what the old folks say. Good as dead, agreed the other. Dead by sunrise. At the top of the stair, the young man lifted his fist to strike the door again. Beyond the door, he heard, faint but unmistakable, the sound of heavy footsteps. He turned and leaped from the steps and ran, charging between his companions, white sneakers racing, elbows pumping. His companions broke into gales of laughter and ran after, their voices lost to the dark. Night turned away, and soon the line of street lamps began to light, one by one, as she walked. Hours passed, their passage marked only by the howl of sirens. No traffic moved down Shadow Street. No lights showed in the windows. On Shadow Street, a light in a window meant life inside. On Shadow Street, life was a thing worth taking. Just before dawn, more footsteps sounded from the trash-choked alley by Roy's shoe repair. With them came no laughter. A slightly built young man emerged from the alley. He fell, struggled to his feet, rose and staggered away, clutching his belly with both hands. The pavement where he'd fallen shone wet in the moonlight. There came voices close and getting closer, harsh voices, loud with rage. The young man heard, tried to run. He took a dozen desperate sprinting steps before falling. He rose, slipped in his own blood. When he fell again, it was at the flight of seven steps that led up to the tall black door at which he had knocked before the night swallowed up his companions and left him bleeding. The black door swung open. Inside was no light. The harsh voices down the street cried out, exulting. The young man heaved himself onto the weathered steps and crawled, the pain in his gut swelling, threatening to tear him in half. One step, two, someone shouted. Three steps, four. The young man's vision faded. His heartbeat sounded like rapid-fire thunder in his head. He felt his life draining away in time with his pulse, leaking past his fingers, making the steps slick beneath him. Five, six. Someone threw a brick, striking his back. Seven. He clawed his way up the last step and thrust his bloody right hand over the threshold of the door, where the dark inside hid it completely. He rose. There may have been hands under his arms, pulling him up and forward but the pain blossomed inside him and his thundering heart gave way and what was darkness became a sudden brilliant light that caught him up and took him away from the steps and the blood and the pain. The last thing he heard was the unhurried closing of the tall black door. 
Something hot touched his lips. The smell of food followed. The young man opened his eyes. You need to eat this, said a voice. It's good soup. Skinny boy such as you, you need good soup. Eat. The boy blinked, his surroundings slowly coming into focus. The spoon pushed past his lips and he opened his mouth and the soup was hot and savory. He lay on his back in a small dark room. There was a lamp on a stand beside him and a man leaning over him, watching him from an old white face lined with wrinkles and half hidden behind a neat white beard. The man smiled down at him. His teeth were paper white. His eyes were blue and clear. He refilled the spoon from a bowl in his lap. Who you? asked the young man after a moment. You may call me Mr. Mortimer, said the man, raising the spoon. I am the owner. Owner? Owner of what? The old man smiled, a paper-white smile. Memories came flooding back. The young man grabbed for his belly, found it tender and sore, but wrapped in cloth and dry, mercifully dry. You came to us last night, injured. There was no time for waiting for the ambulance. I stitched you up myself. I am good with the needle, with the thread. The steps, the tall black door, knocking three times. The young man struggled to rise. I'm in the death house? The old man pushed him back. The young man struggled, but weariness overcame him. There is no reason to be afraid here, said the old man. Those who injured you are gone. I have dressed your wound. You will recover, young man. In that you are very fortunate. The young man's eyes grew wild. Sweat beaded on his forehead, and he clenched his hands into fists. They say nobody what comes in here ever leaves, he said between breaths. Death house. I had to knock. They made me knock. I didn't mean it. The old man shook his head and put the spoon in the bowl and rose. You should rest now, he said. We will speak again soon. You need not fear. This is not a place where death is fearsome. We tend to the dead, yes, but we do not bring death. That ain't what they say. What is your name, young man? The young man's eyes were closed now. His fists fell open and his arms went limp at his side. Raymond, he said. Raymond or Raymond? Raymond, muttered the young man. Raymond Dakes, the old man nodded. Rest, Mr. Dakes, he said. Raymond's breathing became steady and deep. The old man crossed to the door and closed it behind him. Three more times, Raymond Dakes awoke to find a spoon at his lips. These times, a much younger man held the spoon. Bueno, bueno, said the younger man as he fed Raymond. He whispered the words over and over in a chant. Bueno, bueno. He was fat, even his fingers, even his ears. His skin was dark, his hair a thick, curly black. His accent was thick, even in a whisper. He's Mex, thought Raymond, probably West End Diablo or Silver Street Cruiser. Why ain't you ain't cut my throat, asked Raymond once. The Mexican just smiled and proffered the spoon. Bueno, he said, bueno. Raymond swallowed and soon slept. On the fifth day, Raymond rose, helped to his feet by the old man, who showed him to a tiny hot bathroom. Raymond relieved himself and managed a bath. The old man gave him clothes, black pants, white shirt, belt, black socks, and scuffed black fancy church shoes. Old man clothes, thought Raymond, but he put them on, though the pants were hemmed too short and the shoes were tight and stiff. Now you look like a man ready to work, said the old man. Have you ever done that, I wonder? Work? Ain't no jobs here, said Raymond, his eyes wary. The door behind the old man was shut. But was it locked, he wondered. The old man laughed. I tell you before, young Raymond, there is nothing to fear here. If you want to go, you go. I will not stop you. Roddy will not stop you. Although I hope you stay. We need a new knocking man, you see. And you'll have the look of a good knocking man. Roddy? Who's Roddy? Raymond measured the distance to the door. Four steps. Mr. Rodriguez, he works here too. He prefers to be called Roddy. He tended to you. Perhaps you remember, yes? The Mex? The old man shrugged. I do not know Mr. Rodriguez's background. He speaks very little. But he is hard worker and a gentle soul. You treat him nice, you hear? 
The old man watched Raymond's eyes. He stepped suddenly aside and waved his arm at this room's single door. As I said, you may leave. Consider the garments a gift. Return to the street, if you will. Raymond took a step. I wish you luck, Mr. Dex, because I tell you this plain, young man. Out there is death, brutal and swift and sure. You know the truth of this, do you not? I ain't dead yet, said Raymond. No, and in that lies your hope. Stay, work. You will be paid a decent wage, given a roof, given a bed. The food is plain, but plentiful. The old man beckoned toward the door. The choice is yours, Mr. Dex. Stay and work. Go and die. Perhaps not tonight. Perhaps not the next. But soon. You know this, yes? Raymond felt his wound ache. Remembered the terrible moment the knife bit into his belly. Remembered little Joe falling, T.J. coughing blood. The door beckoned. But beyond it, what? Raymond sagged. What I got to do, he asked. What kind of work? The door opened and the mech stepped through it, smiling, a bowl of soup steaming in his hands. Bueno, he said, in a tone that said hello. Bueno! Despite the aching in his gut, Raymond Dakes found himself smiling. The old man is wrong about Roddy, thought Raymond. He talks all the time, just the same word over and over. Bueno, said Roddy, as he scrubbed the floor in the death house's cramped embalming room. Bueno, bueno, bueno. He ain't talking, Raymond realized. He's singing. Raymond recognized the tune, a dance song two summers old, something about girls in Cali. Roddy sang it as he scrubbed dark old stains from the warped oak floor, every word the same. Raymond helped, though the wound kept him from doing more than a few half-hearted brushstrokes at a time. Roddy didn't seem to mind doing most of the work. Simple in the head, thought Raymond. Must have sampled one too many hits of that West End crack. The death house was quiet, aside from the scrub, scrub, scrub of the brushes and Roddy's sing-song voice. Raymond listened for shouts or curses or the thump of passing car stereos, but the sounds of the city seemed to falter just beyond the death house walls. Roddy pulled up his long sleeve to dip his brush into the soap bucket. Raymond glimpsed the mex's chubby arm. There was a long, coiling tattoo, nearly obscured by hundreds of raised round scars. Burn scars, from cigarettes held against flesh until it bubbled and broke and bled. Roddy saw Raymond wince and pulled his sleeve back down. The mex was silent for the rest of the day, and he did not smile until the old man called them to the kitchen for supper. Another week passed while Raymond healed. The death house fell into an easy routine. Wake and dress, shirt buttoned, shoes shined and tied. Breakfast was two eggs, three strips of, bur- of bacon, and two fat biscuits with grape jam. Raymond couldn't remember ever having breakfast, not at a table. Not a breakfast that woke him with the sounds of bacon frying and eggs cracking and oven doors creaking. Aunt Mavis didn't cook. After breakfast, work which might mean scrubbing floors or washing dishes or ironing the dark clothes in the closets. Raymond wondered why the shirts fastened up the back until the old man explained that it made it easier to dress the dead. It was the dead Raymond never saw. The hearse parked behind the death house never once went to fetch a body to be dressed in the back-buttoning shirts. No one knocked at the tall black door. Raymond looked up at the realization. Roddy smiled at him, an old-fashioned feather duster clutched in his pudgy right hand. Roddy, said Raymond. Roddy tilted his head. You ever hear knocking at that door? Bueno, said Roddy, with a hint of confusion. Bueno? Knocking, said Raymond. You know, like this. Raymond rapped on the wall three times. Roddy threw his duster down and charged out of the room slamming the door and howling as he ran. Raymond dashed after, calling his name. Boys, boys, cried the old man, emerging from the embalming room. What is this? Raymond, what have you done? Raymond heard the back door rattle as Roddy pulled at it. The old man shook his head as he too heard the rattle of the chains that held the door fast, and he motioned for Raymond to follow. They found Roddy straining to open the back door against the chains. Bueno, cried Roddy, his face split with a smile. Bueno, bueno, bueno. 
The old man laid his hand gently on Roddy's shoulder. You made a knock for him, you did. Raymond, wide-eyed, nodded yes. I was just asking what we do if somebody comes in and wants in, he said. I didn't mean to make him crazy. I and I alone opened that door, Mr. Dex. Not you, not Mr. Rodriguez. Do you understand that? Yeah, said Raymond. Yes, sir, he amended. Good. What we do about him? The old man shrugged. He will soon forget. I wait with him. The old man regarded Raymond for a long moment and then smiled. You are feeling better in your gut now, yes? Yes, sir. Good. There are keys in the bureau by the desk book. Three keys, all iron. One for the shed out back. Unlock it and find tools. Another unlocks the cemetery gates. Go there. The weeds have taken over. Trim them. Yes, sir. The old man shook his head. This is no punishment, young man. It is another job that needs doing. Roddy is better working inside. But you will learn to like the work, I think. The old man's grin widened. We'll make a knocking man of you yet. Roddy motioned Raymond forward with his hand, still pulling at the door. Bueno, he said, his face joyous. Bueno! Raymond hurried from the room as the old man began to sing. Raymond's hands bled every day the first week clearing the tiny cemetery. Skin peeled in ragged patches. Angry blisters rose on his palms, on his fingertips. Each evening, the old man would inspect his hands gravely and produce a pan of hot, salty water for soaking. There is no need to injure yourself, young Raymond, he would say. Wear the gloves, slow down. The weeds, they wait. Bueno, said Roddy, shaking his head and not smiling at sight of Raymond's wounded palms. I'll slow down, promised Raymond. But he didn't. Instead, he wielded the antique sling blade like a fury, swinging it back and forth, weeds flying, until his sides ached and his arms were limp and spots danced before his eyes. Then he would lie down in the cool shade of one of the two oak trees that huddled over the headstones until his vision cleared and his breaths came easy. Then he would rise and take up the blade and attack the weeds once again. The cemetery was tiny, tiny and hidden behind a thick wall of briars and sweet-smelling honeysuckle vines that long ago entangled the iron fence into an impenetrable wall of foliage. Raymond tried to recall anyone ever calling the lot behind the death house a cemetery and could not. No one knows, he thought. The blade sliced down. Weeds flew. My secret. He reversed the blade's motion as he took a half step forward. Mine. Raymond uncovered 21 headstones hidden in the shade and the weeds. The names on most were long gone. Some of the dates remained. 1867. 1898, 1923, beloved husband, beloved wife, infant daughter, infant son. Raymond worked carefully near the headstones. He struck one and raised sparks and knocked a chip of marble off, and the air grew cold and the bees working among the honeysuckles sought sudden refuge in the sky. Sorry, said Raymond, resting his hand on the headstone. Real sorry about that. The bees resumed buzzing. When Raymond lifted his hand, there was blood, and he wiped it away with a rag. By the second week, Raymond's calloused hands no longer bled. By the third, his t shirts grew tighter through the shoulders, and the old man would tease him at breakfast. Our Raymond is becoming a circus strongman, he would say, flexing his own spare frame. Soon he is on posters. Raymond the Strong. Roddy would laugh and mimic the old man's posture. Bueno! Raymond would feel his face flushing and laugh. He had half the cemetery cleared, leaving no weed standing more than ankle high. He discovered a weeping angel, flying cherub spiraling heavenward around a tall white pillar, and a stone man knelt in prayer. All had been covered in moss and lichens, and all had been scrubbed clean with a wire brush in two days of work. The old man never asked, never set foot through the cemetery gates. Raymond felt himself almost blurt out news of his progress, news of his finds, every morning at breakfast. But the words never quite passed his lips. Time to go was the most he managed. The old man would smile and nod. 
Roddy would say his goodbyes with a cheery bueno and set about clearing the tiny kitchen table. On the Wednesday of the fifth week, Raymond swung the sling blade one final time, and the tiny cemetery was cleared at last. Cleared, but still a secret. The wall of honeysuckle and briar still rose up on every side. The two stooped old oaks still hid most of the headstones from the sky. Sometimes Raymond heard sirens pass. Sometimes he heard voices and breaking glass, and once there was even a gunshot. But that was out there. Inside the briars, Raymond leaned on his sling blade and wiped sweat from his brow with his shirt sleeve and looked upon the place he had cleared with nothing but his labor. The weeping angel wept. The praying man prayed. The cherubs flew, circling up toward a heaven they never reached. Amid them, twenty-one headstones leaned or stood or sunk, marking the twenty-one graves Raymond came to know, if not by name, by date. For the first time since passing the gates, Raymond laid down on the ground in the shade to sleep. Weariness covered him like a blanket. Not the same kind of weariness he'd felt so many times out there. That was a weariness born of fear and hunger and hopelessness. Raymond tried to put words to this new weariness, but the only word he could find was Roddy's. Bueno, then. Bueno it is. And then Raymond slept, there in the shade of the oak, while a weeping angel kept watch at his feet. Raymond awoke to the sound of knocking. Above him, the cemetery's two scrawny squirrels sat on an oak limb and twitched their tails. Bees worked among the honeysuckles. The shade was cool and damp, and it smelled of fresh-cut grass. Knock, knock, knock. Three knocks, distant and muffled. Raymond remembered his own three knocks at the death house door, and he wondered again what the old man meant when he spoke of the knocking man. Raymond raised his hand to rub his eyes. The squirrel scampered away. Three more knocks sounded. Raymond sat up. The knocking continued, fainter now, but still audible. Raymond turned his head this way and that, listening for the knocking amid the buzzing of bees and the gentle tossing of oak leaves and a smog-tainted breeze. It wasn't until Raymond bent and put his ear to the soil that he realized the knocking was coming from the ground. Raymond shivered. The cemetery shade went cold, chilling him to the bone, freezing him in his damp white shirt and sweat-soaked trousers. Raymond looked toward the cemetery gates, saw himself running through them, running past the death house, running back to the housing project on Ninth in the grudging, erratic charity of Aunt Mavis. The knocking came faster and harder. Raymond looked away from the gates. The weed he'd cleared were growing again here and there. Still on his hands and knees, he began to crawl from place to place, listening for the knocking and creeping towards its source. Mrs. Samuel, something you could not read, 1889 to 1937. Beloved daughter, resting with angels? You are sure, Mr. Dix? Raymond nodded. Yes, sir. The old man smiled. We shall see. Roddy, you will go and fetch the shovels, no? Wait for me by the gate. Bueno, said Roddy as he ran for the door. Raymond shifted his feet, his eyes on the floor. You are disturbed, said the old man. He put his thin hand on Raymond's shoulder. I understand, but as I told you when you arrived, there is nothing to fear here. We merely tend to the dead. Ain't seen no tending, said Raymond in a whisper. No dead neither. That will change tonight. But here, young man, you are the knocking man, not the digging man. That is for Roddy and I. Lay out the gown. See that the hearse will start. We will all have much to do tonight, we will. Unless you would leave us? You may, you know. No one will stop you. Raymond looked up into the old man's eyes. What you do here? What you really do? We tend to the dead, said the old man. Nothing more. Nothing less. Stay and see. Or go. I like you, young Raymond. But that choice to stay or to go, it is always yours. The old man left Raymond alone. He did not close the door behind him. After a while, 
Raymond found a fancy lace-trimmed burial gown and a veiled white hat to match. He ironed the gown until the last wrinkle was gone. Then he found the keys to the hearse and spent the next hour coaxing the neglected engine into smoking, rumbling life. After that, he walked to the cemetery gates. They were locked, and though the key rested in Raymond's trouser pocket, he went no further. But he listened. He could hear the bite of shovels being plunged into the earth, his earth. He could hear the thump of fresh-dug dirt as it was dumped onto the ground. He could hear Roddy's merry sing-song streams of buenos and the old man's voice as he urged Roddy on. Much later, when the sky was going dark and the street lights began to flicker and hum, Raymond heard a shovel strike something solid. Careful, careful, said the old man. Hold your shovel flat, uncover the lid like this. We are nearly done. Raymond turned and ran, where he didn't know, for six panic steps. But the tall black door beckoned, and Raymond followed, his heart pounding like he'd once again seen the glint of a knife in the moonlight. Raymond sat at the kitchen table and cut weeds with the sling blade in his head. He felt the weight of the smooth oak handle in his hands. He felt the blade slice down, felt it bite grass, felt it tug and slice and clear a swath of ground, his ground. He heard the sound of the blade, snick, snick, heard the little grunt he always made on the downswing. Uh, he heard anything but shovels, anything but digging. I was a young boy in Budapest, said the old man. Raymond jumped, grabbed involuntarily at the blade he wasn't holding. He hadn't heard the door open, hadn't heard footsteps. A poor boy like you, bad part of town. These gangs, you think they are new? Bah! The old man pulled back a chair and sat. Raymond didn't look him in the eye. There was a cemetery, said the old man. People called it at Kozat Halot. Curse it. They say these things of this place. No? Raymond didn't answer. One night I am chased. One night, Mr. Dakes, I am wounded. I crawl into a crypt in the at Kozat Halot. I hide there. I hope those who wounded me dare not follow. Do you know what happened to me there, Mr. Dex? Raymond shook his head no. I saw a dead man valk. The old man shivered. First he rose. I was, how you say, tough kid, young Raymond. Still, I void my bowels. Beg for mercy. I am not ashamed. Dead don't walk, said Raymond. This man did. He walked and more. The gang who wounded me followed me into the cemetery, Mr. Dex. They were not frightened by the old stories, but they found fear they did. The old man's face was grim. To the last. Can't be, said Raymond. Can't be. It is, said the old man. Later I learned, as you were doing, that some few of the dead cannot rest. There are many reasons. That is not our concern. Our concern is tending to them until they rise and walk no more. You crazy. I said much the same. Mr. Rodriguez. The kitchen door opened and Roddy stepped in. He wore a black suit coat, a black tie, and a black hat like the fancy limo drivers wore. Bueno. The hearse, will it start? Raymond nodded yes. Roddy, fetch our guest. Roddy grinned and departed, leaving the kitchen door open. You going to send Roddy out driving? Raymond clenched his fist. Roddy? Alone? Not alone, young Raymond. Never alone. Roddy's shadow fell across the open doorway. Meet Mrs. Samuel Rorst, said the old man, wagging his index finger in Raymond's face. Please, no voiding of the bowels. Roddy walked into the kitchen, smiling. Behind him came a corpse. She walked. Not well, not quickly, but she walked. She wore the clean white gown Raymond had ironed and the white veiled hat he had chosen sat atop her bare and grinning skull. Bueno, said Roddy. He bent his elbow and offered the corpse his arm. The dead woman, hardly more than bones and patches of mummified skin that broke and fell away with every movement, took Roddy's arm. 
She clacked her lipless jaws shut and leaned tight against Roddy, her bony face tilted up at him as if an adoring bride. Raymond fainted when the dead woman tickled Roddy's chin. Raymond awoke. The old man stopped shaking him and chuckled. You did not solve yourself, he said. He bore bright yellow gloves stained with dark smears. Great flakes of brown mummy stuff littered the floor. Where, Raymond said, beginning to shake. The old man shrugged. He's not my business. Roddy drives her. Roddy waits. What Aaron and Mrs. Rorst pursues this night is not for us to know. Roddy not scared? What Roddy has seen in his short life, Mr. Dakes, it is so bad the dead hold no terrors for him. Or perhaps he sees her as she once was. It does not matter. Raymond thought of the streets, the gangs, the guns. Thought of Roddy alone, greeting mayhem with only a bueno and his smile. He shouldn't be out there, he said. He began to rise, but the old man shook his head no. Make no mistake, young man. The dead Mary appear fragile. Roddy is safe. Only those who would deter Mrs. Aurora start in peril. You knew that was her knocking down in the ground. I did not. I could no longer hear them. Too old. But I know a knocking man when I see one, young Raymond. The old man looked weary and rubbed his eyes. If you choose to be, of course. It is a lonely life, but peaceful. The dead ask little. They make no complaint. Raymond stared at the table. They will be gone until sunrise, said the old man. Then we will lay Mrs. Rorst to rest, cover her grave, wait for the next to knock. He rose and yawned. I will see you in the morning, Raymond, if you are still here. We will have three eggs each. The old man walked from the room. Raymond sat for a time. He thought of Roddy steering the hearse through the night, a dead woman at his side. Bueno, he's telling her. Bueno. What has Roddy seen, Raymond wondered. What is worse than the dead? Raymond remembered T.J. bleeding and dying. He remembered being stabbed, being hungry, being lost, hiding in shadows, running, always running. Soon, Raymond rose, found the old straw broom and the battered tin dustpan, and set about sweeping the leavings of Mrs. Rorst, 1889 to 1937, off the kitchen floor. The End The Knocking Man first appeared in the anthology Shadow Street, produced by Coolwell Press and edited by Denise Vitola. The opening music was Scary Sound by Mark D'Angelo. Happy Halloween!